Hello, I'm Shahar Razani, the Northeast Executive Director for Stand With Us, an Israel education organization, and I'm together in the studio with Julie Hazan, the U.S. Director at Honest Reporting, whose mission is to detect and identify media bias. Together, we are joined today by Hunter Stewart. Hunter is a journalist and writer, currently working as a senior editor at Dose Media in Chicago. He was formerly a staff reporter and editor at the Huffington Post in New York from 2010 to 2015. Most recently, Hunter worked as a freelance reporter in the Middle East, where he wrote for Vice, the Jerusalem Post, Al Jazeera English, the International Business Times, and others. His reporting has also appeared on CNN, Pacific Standard, The Daily Mail, Yahoo News, Slate, Talking Points Memo, and The Atlantic Wire. Pleasure having you here with us, Hunter. Thanks so much, Shahar. It's the, the pleasure is all mine. Um, let me start by asking you um, the general question of what made you deal with media in general? What attracted you to the media sphere? Oh, man, I've wanted to be a journalist for as long as I can remember. Um, my, my dad made documentary films for 20, 30 years, and um, yeah, I don't know, at some point maybe I was a, a teenager and I was reading about, about war and about conflict, and I was reading the news and the New York Times, and I just got into my head that being a journalist would be a really cool job, and so I Nobody went for it. Nobody was able to dissuade you? <laughs> No, my, my teachers encouraged my dreams. And specifically coming to, you mentioned conflicts, what attracted you to the Middle East? Israel, the Palestinians, I mean, do you have any specific background in that field? Do you, have you engaged with it before your media? Right, so, um, not, I mean, not really. When I, when I was 16, I went on a, a family trip to Egypt for, I think it was 10 days, and that was right before 9-11 happened, and... Um, you know, after that, I don't know, I just I just started getting interested in the Middle East, and I was always interested in war, and most of the wars in the world seemed to be happening there, so I just found myself voraciously consuming news about the Middle East and the way that U.S. policy was affecting the region, and I was fascinated by, like, suicide bombers, like, oh my God, these guys are going to give up their lives, they believe in this so much. It was just fascinating to me, so... It was my dream to be a freelance reporter in the Middle East, and at some point I decided that if I wanted to make that dream a reality, I, I needed to act on it. And I looked at a map, and it came down to choosing where I was going to go, and, you know, um, it's not such a hospitable region, so Jerusalem seemed like, seemed like the best place to go. So your, your trip to the Middle East before your stint in Israel was that trip to Egypt? Yeah, exactly. And what do you remember of that trip in Egypt? You know, I remember um, I remember riding a bike around Cairo and um, buying some beers illegally from the back room of some supermarket, and um, just like talking talking to Arabs. And do you know Arabic? Do you speak Arabic? Did you? I spent five years in New York learning to speak Arabic, um, and so. That, that was, of course, later. That was when I was in my 20s working at the Huffington Post. I was taking night classes, learning to, learning to speak Arabic. And this was all in, in preparation for, you know, to, to make my dream of being a reporter in the Middle East a uh, reality. Wow. And that's even, you know, before when we come into the last decade in which the Middle East has garnered so many headlines on so many different angles. Truly fascinating to see someone chartering their own course from an early age and then moving on it. And as you mentioned, here are the dots on the map and you make a decision to come to Jerusalem. I think that's interesting why I chose Jerusalem is um, a lot of the reason that journalists do is because it's a nice place to live. There's restaurants and cafes and nice parks and um, they, people speak English there. It's a pretty westernized city. It's pretty safe, but it's really close to the most publicized conflict in in the world. Why did you have you ever been to Israel before that uh, before no. that decision? No, right. never been. So how did you know? How did you know that Israel was hospitable? I don't know. I just you know I read the news. Like I have friends who had been like I talked to people who had been to the Middle East. Like there's a lot that you can learn on the internet uh, 
mm-hmm. without actually traveling. Yeah. Right. And there it is. You make the decision to move to Jerusalem. When you uh, tell the news to your friends, to your family, what do they tell you? They're like, oh, man, that's that's crazy. Like, good for you. But isn't isn't that dangerous over there? And right. Yeah. And and still you decided to go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm stubborn, and when I get something in my head, like, yeah, I, I got to do it. What did you expect before coming here? What did you expect to see in Israel? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, like, even though I had made a decision to move to Israel, like, um, I had a pretty negative view of, of the country and especially of the government. Um, I sort of I saw them as being um, having horrible policies that verged on on racism and I thought that they were um, oppressing Palestinians in a way that not only was unjust and inhumane and violating the human rights of Palestinians but that was destabilizing the entire region um, so I had this idea that the, the sort of global jihadi movement was based in part on what was happening in Jerusalem and so I saw a You know the fault lines of the war on terror as as running through Jerusalem so I think to some extent I I blamed Israel for that right and and you're saying this as someone who's already a seasoned media professional with incredible interest in the region who is a smart intelligent researcher of information and this is the image that's being portrayed this is what you're expecting to encounter on the ground before heading to Israel and Yeah, exactly. I mean, my, my views of, of Israel and of the conflict were based mostly on the, the news that I was consuming. So like, yeah, hundreds of news articles that I read over the course of, of yeah, maybe portray the certain image. And, yeah. and as far as the country itself is concerned, what did you expect to see there as far as technology and, and progress and development? Was there anything there that you were anticipating to see that you heard before? I mean, I knew that Israel was pretty developed compared to the rest of the region. So like I knew it was a first world country and that it had that it had impressive technology and like, yeah, like highways and bridges and you know, nuclear program and all that stuff. Camels. Camels, <laughs> right? Of course, of course. Some people still uh, refer to Israel when it comes to you know the Israelites and the camels. and it's interesting to hear. You know opinions out there of people before they uh, yeah. before they venture onto Israel but then you get to Israel and may I ask you what was your first impression of Israel upon arrival first thing that comes to your mind I'm trying to remember like oh god I can tell you it's not it's not great honestly I so I went to I went to Amman first and so I came to Israel over the Allenby bridge oh, so you drove in drove in and of course Allenby yeah it's like Um, it, I think it's mostly for VIPs and for Palestinians because it goes directly into the West Bank but I didn't I didn't know that so I cruised over the Allenby bridge and um, it, the Israelis were like who are you and what are you doing I'm like I'm here to be a journalist they're like do you have a work contract or something or an assignment I'm like no like I just I just got here like I haven't figured that out yet um, they were like okay well um, you can't work in Israel without a work permit and so I It turned into this whole this whole thing where I, I basically ha- I was not prepared I had not really done done my homework so they they gave me a tourist visa um, and let me in but we had a good two-hour conversation first <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you drove in at that point with your family no no it was it was just me just you and they joined me. you they joined you later my uh, well my wife came about two months later yeah. By the way, how was she about the move? How did she feel about the move to Israel? She was supportive. Like, it wasn't her top choice for what to do. I mean, I think she was doing it because she could tell that I, was, that I was passionate about it. And so she was supportive of, of me. Yeah. So professionally speaking, you arrive in Israel through the Allenby Crossing, driving in after a discussion with Israeli authorities. And here you are with... What was to be you know your existing preconceptions and uh, immediate experience then what happens professionally as you as you're on the ground starting to work well it took me a little while to find work at first you know because I was I was brand new to Israel and um, yeah I had just quit my job in New York so I didn't it took me a little while to actually get assignments um, so at first you know I was just I moved into uh, an apartment in the 
Katamon and then in Nakhlaot. And I just, I had roommates, you know, because I was on, I was trying to save as much money as possible. So I was, I had no work and I was just meeting people, walking around. I, I went to Tel Aviv. I was, you know, yeah, I was just, I was just ex- exploring at first. And at that point in time, you're still hunting for the stories. You're still creating your connections on the ground, getting to know the lay of the land. Who was, do you remember, aside from the Israeli officials at the Allenby Crossing Point, who was the, uh, another Israeli whom you met at the beginning of your path who made an impression or an interesting impression, be that positive or negative? God, there are so many. I mean, like one, like one of my roommates was um, a woman in her 50s who was a, a public defender Um, in Jerusalem at the courthouse and she was a Sephardic Jew who had grown up in Canada and then made Aliyah but her family was from Morocco and they had been driven out of Morocco at the time that Israel was created and um, she was extremely supportive of Israel diehard Zionist and um, you know at the time like I was I was very pro-Palestinian and um, very very um, defensive and suspicious of anybody who is pro-Israel in, in, in any way. So it, I was terrified to be living with this woman because I thought she was a total wacko, but like she was really sweet and we got to know each other really well. Her name was Smadar. I'm sure she would be fine with me naming her. Mm-hmm. And she, you know she would she would make these little Shabbat dinners just just for herself and she would invite me to have them and we would just talk and talk and talk and it was cool because Yeah, we were to- two totally opposite ends of the political spectrum, but, but we became to be good friends. Did, were you surprised to find a Moroccan Jew? I was definitely surprised. Like, I had no idea that there was that whole Jewish refugee crisis when Israel was created. That was one of the pieces of history that either was not available to me in my reading or it just hadn't fit into my narrative. And so... I just didn't pay attention to it. When I got there and I, I met those people and I met Jews from Iran and from Iraq and stuff, I was like, wow, this is, this is incredible. Yeah, Moroccan Jews didn't only flee to Israel. They went to France also. I'm oh, a very go. proud Moroccan oh, Jew oh, right. myself. So I'm glad you had a, a good experience with a are you Mar- Are you Moroccan, Moroccan heritage? Uh, oh, yeah. Cool. Good food. Great food. <laughs> I, can, I can attest to that. It's the my best wife food. is also Moroccan Jew. Oh, really? <laughs> and I and my family came from Yemen. Oh, really? Yes. So okay. the reality is... You're really among, you among uh, Sephardic Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I had no Jews. idea. So a lot of people don't. A lot of people view Israel through what the other side is trying to dictate Israel as a country that has no roots in the region, a people that's foreign to it. If you remember the late Helen Thomas who said, let the Jews go back to Poland and Germany. Well, I can assure you neither Julie nor I am able to go back to Poland or Germany. Where we, where our families came from, there is very little ability to have a viable Jewish life as other minorities face in the Middle East today. Christians everywhere and other minorities face incredible difficulties and That's why, you know, sometimes the visual is the message. So it's fascinating to hear of your experience as you first interact with that reality on the ground. What surprised you about Israel when you arrived in Israel? Um, there, there were a number of things. I mean, <clears throat> it surprised me, first of all, how diverse it was, because I think that I pictured it as just being all, you know, white Ashkenazim, um, if that's the right word. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. You put the M on it when it's plural, right? Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, my Hebrew is not great, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, so it surprised me how diverse it was. I was like, oh, my God, there's Muslim Israelis and Druze Israelis, and look, they have equal rights as anybody, and they, they seem happy to be living here. Um, it surprised me how tiny Israel was. I was like, uh, this country is only nine miles wide in certain places, and... I, um, a friend of mine in Jerusalem told me that the whole country of Israel is smaller than the state of Massachusetts and I'm from Massachusetts so I, I you know because reading about it in the news is like it feels so big because it gets so much media attention but when you when you're there you realize it's, it's really small yes yeah, so th- on that on that note because Israel is a very small country but we Israel concentrated also like journalists like there is 700 journalists and um, In a year uh, long and uh, I'm sure you made a lot of uh, journalist friends uh, in between but my question is uh, mostly regarding um, 
uh, your experience with other journalists also how did you feel uh, towards them and what do you uh, like about writing stories with with other journalists yeah, with, collaborating, I mean, yeah with collaborating and meeting them and yeah I mean I, I did have a few journalist friends in Jerusalem and also um, in the Palestinian territories um, but I didn't not not really that many I'd say it was a very small handful um, I mean there's there's a Facebook community where I knew a lot of them just on just on Facebook there's like a group where they all sort of work together to answer each other's questions solve logistics that kind of thing um, they were all over the all over the map I wouldn't say like all of them were like yeah like diehard you know Palestinian supporters or anything um, I mean Some of them were were pretty supportive of Israel. I'm thinking of one in particular who I worked with a couple times. Um, who was she was married to an Israeli. So, um, but yeah, she, you know, she supported Israel, and I think she mostly sold her stories to conservative outlets because, um, yeah, <laughs> nowhere else would probably take them. But um, and others, what kind of attitude towards Israel you saw with others? Were they? Um critical of Israel or sometimes did they go to even more extremes I mean I think probably in their in their work they were critical of Israel but honestly like when we were just hanging out like they they were pretty cool like I didn't get a sense from them like they were super anti Israeli so I don't know if maybe just when they're you know when they're writing something like that tends to be the, the stance that they take because that's what their their employer wants but I mean I I didn't have any bad you know really bad experiences where I like would get in fights with people um, but you know also my own evolution on the conflict and on politics like you know happened slowly so for a while you know I was also very was also very anti Israel in certain ways so maybe I didn't I wouldn't have noticed it but I don't know. Did you travel a lot between the Palestinian territories and the uh, state of Israel? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I was, uh, like I said, I was learning Arabic and like I really wanted to practice my Arabic as much as possible. So I, I spent a total of three months between the Palestinian territories, including Gaza mm-hmm. and um, in Jordan, which of course is a majority Palestinian country. And what did you feel as far as the media environment and the hospitability of the, uh, your surroundings between, let's say, Jordan, the West Bank, Gaza and Israel? Hospitality wise, um, the people are extremely generous. I mean, it, it's over the top, honestly, um, like uh, taxi drivers in Amman or in Hebron will try to get you to come over for tea or for lunch and you have to f- sort of fight them off because um, otherwise you'd be literally just having tea all, all day because strangers on the street <laughs> want to have you over um, so like they're incredibly incredibly generous um, people but um, yeah like the I mean the media environment over there is is so not good I mean first of all you know I would be frightened to you tell people that I had a Jewish wife or tell people my real feelings about Israel or even mention that I live in West Jerusalem which is of course the Jewish section of town until I get to know a Palestinian there's no way in hell I'm saying that stuff out loud you know and that that's a sense you got safe. from the very beginning you got that sense yeah you... I had that sense yeah I had I, I think I knew it in my in my gut was like just keep your mouth shut about that kind of information because you Yeah, it's not necessarily safe. Yet on the Israeli yeah. side, you mentioned that you had your discussions with Smadar and of others. Course. Exactly. Yeah. You've, you, you hit the nail on the head. Like, that was a realization I had after a while. It was like, okay, I feel so comfortable criticizing Israelis. From the minute I meet them, I feel like I can say anything to them, even the, the most aggressive, hostile thing. I can speak my mind, and I know I'm going to be safe. But in Gaza, are you, are you kidding? Hell no. I was just smiling and nodding, no matter what they said, because it's the Gaza Strip, and like, they decide who gets to leave. And I wanted to be able to get out, you know? So. Yes, yeah, so I, I wanted to ask you, how do you think about the news reporting and how How editors decide between fact and opinion oh you know what just before just before that what turned the tide for you at what point did you wake up and say something is not right here I I need to start 
you know, telling the story the way it is. What happened? Yeah, I mean, so there was no, there was no one aha moment where it's like snap of the fingers. It was much more gradual than that. But um, the biggest thing was the stabbing attacks that were happening. I mean, you know, that, that whole, that whole wave of violence happens, began about a month after my wife and I moved to Jerusalem. And so we were living near the, the Shuk in, you know, in Nachlaot. So that's central Jerusalem. The attacks are happening all over the place in the same places that we went grocery shopping and went out for our iced coffees. And so it was like, I knew that stuff happened because I had read about it, but then seeing it in person was was a whole a whole different story. And then there was something else that really echoed from your written pieces. That moment in the Palestinian refugee camp in East Jerusalem, as you come out of the car and you're surrounded by the kids, and you have to say, in Jerusalem, in Israel, today, I am not Jewish. Tell us a bit about that moment. Yeah, that's right. That was in that was in Silwan, which is yeah in East Jerusalem, but it's right it's right outside the Temple Mount. It's it connects to the old city, but it's a really really poor neighborhood, and yeah, it's it's pre- it's pretty radical. Um, of course, I didn't know that at the time when I walked in there, wearing like my boat shoes and like my khaki shorts and looking like a total gaper. Um, <laughs> So, like, I was out of my element for sure. Like, most journalists go in there with a fixer and maybe some security. And I know for for Jews who live there, like, they need round-the-clock security. Um, But, yeah, for me, like, literally as soon as I got into the neighborhood, I was like, holy crap, this place is kind of terrifying. And I saw this group of kids, like, near a corner store, I think, and... One of them looked at me and just started screaming, Yehudi, Yehudi. And all his friends just turned around and looked at me and like something glimmered in their eyes and they all started running at me. And it was utterly terrifying. And luckily I was able to speak enough Arabic that I could tell them I'm an American journalist. I said, oh, Philistine, like I love Palestine, whatever, like I could say to get them to chill out. You know, I'm not Jewish, so um, I wasn't lying, but I was like, okay, I have tons of Jewish friends, and they have my whole life. And so just because they don't want to kill me, um, you know, it, it made me feel like what it was like to be Jewish. And, and you know, the, your, that statement, you know, reading your account of that moment touched not only us here, but so many other people who read your piece, because it connects you to that moment, that famous moment when another journalist comes out with a statement, uh, the late Daniel Pearl of blessed memory, my father is Jewish, my mother is Jewish, I am Jewish. And here you are, Hunter Stewart, standing at that moment in the heart of, you know, the Jewish capital today, and uttering the words, I am not Jewish, understanding that uttering these words will save your life. And that's a chilling moment for any individual, and especially for someone whose life mission has been unraveling and covering the truth. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. You know, I was at a I was at a party in Amman like a few months after that, and I met I met a Palestinian guy who was from Silwan, and like he was a secular dude. He was a total hipster, but he was. I told him that story, right? And he was like, "You are so lucky that you're not Jewish, because if you were, they would they would have killed you." Amazing. And, and you're talking about the knife intifada. Unfortunately, you know, we're seeing attacks um, by Palestinian terrorists. You're there with your wife. How does that make you feel? I mean, I can imagine she didn't stay at home the whole day. And here she goes, you know, out in Jerusalem, out and about. Were you at some points afraid for her? Yeah, of course, I was afraid also, because if anything happened, you know, yeah, so she's she's Jewish. Um, if anything happened to her, um, yeah, I would have, you know, I would have felt so guilty because she was only there because because of me, anyways. So, so yeah, I, I, absolutely. So you experience Israeli reality firsthand, and it makes you think, you know, and rethink about how you do your work. And now I'm reaching Julie's question, which is: so many of the reporting, you know, combines opinions and facts and realities. How do you draw the line when you're telling reality between, you know? opinions and facts how do you do it 
it's not the easiest of tasks today, and so many face that challenge. Yeah, I mean, okay, so if you're if you're writing a news article, you're not allowed to be opinionated, right? Like that's the rule. Um, and so, I I won't put my opinions in a news article, but like the decision to write a certain story versus another is already a subjective act because what you're selecting as your subject completely is based on what story you want to tell. So, I mean, if you if you count the number of stories about Israeli oppression versus the number of stories about Egyptian oppression or Bahraini oppression or something, I mean, the number of stories about it, Israel are, are much more. What's what's the di- what's the difference? There's governments of many countries commit horrible human rights abuses and rarely make the front page of the major newspapers. So the story selection is is subjective, even if everything in the story is is a is a straight fact. And here you are telling it like it is, sharing realities from the ground as it's seen by Israel and by so many Israelis. What kind of reactions are you getting from your surround? Because I can imagine that they they notice the tilt, the shift in your in your views. You know, from one point before uh, boots on the ground and then after. How does that work? There's a range of reactions. Like first first of all, I mean, I had I had incredibly welcoming and warm reactions from. people all over the world when I wrote my first piece about my change of perspective. Um, yeah, a lot of them were Jewish, um, but yeah, some of them were not. I mean, I had, I had emails from Arabs and even from Palestinians thanking me for what I wrote and telling me that it was really fair and even they are sick of the same old narrative and the, and the liberal bias. So that was obviously incredible. On Facebook, I had some, I had a couple friends lashing out at me. Um, one of them is a Palestinian American guy who called me a disgrace and claimed that I hadn't spent nearly enough time among Arabs to get to know their story, even though, like I told you, I spent um, three months living among them and, and writing about their stories and speaking their language and eating their food. Um, so there was definitely some negative, blowback but honestly like most of the reaction has has been has been pretty good I mean people are congratulating me for being brave and for for telling a good story I mean it's a it's a good story and that's honestly that's what that's what people want to hear you are unfortunately today we're part of the minority because we, we, we see the reporting that's coming out out there. Only as recent as the last attacks in Jerusalem in which the Palestinian rioters who attacked police and, and died and, and a Jewish family who you know, was stabbed to death, slaughtered in their own home during Shabbat dinner, and it's equated, the number of deaths. Have you ever regretted your, your shift in, in change? Because you're part of a small grain of truth-tellers, and that's not the easiest thing done today in the world. Have you ever regretted that or no I don't I don't I don't regret it I mean it still causes me some ambivalence from time to time just because um, you know I, I still I do have like a lot of Palestinian friends um, and like a lot of them were like I said like very very generous and kind to me and it's hard to like reconcile that you know because you They're very, very warm on a, this personal level. Um, but then there's all these other issues. So it's, yeah, so there's, there's definitely still some reconciling that, that I needed to. But do I regret it? No, it, it, felt, it felt really good. Like, um, I've always been afraid of what people think of me and like always working in the media, I'm always afraid of becoming the subject of a story where somebody, calls me an Islamophobe because I, I dared to criticize Islam. And that's maddening. And that pissed me off because we're supposed to have freedom of speech in this country. And I should be able to criticize whatever I want. So um, it, it, felt, it felt good to like sort of break through that wall. And as, as uh, people who know Israel very well, we can tell you that criticizing anything and everything at any given moment on any given part of the day. <laughs> right, Julie? Yes. <laughs> Part and parcel of who we are. 
and good it for is. you and good for the general conversation to have some different voices Absolutely. who are able to contend with with the truth um, maybe a message because you know there are a lot of um, young journalists people who listen to us and want to know you know they chart their own path and here you are from that 16 year old boy traveling in Egypt as a tourist through the tumultuous you know sent uh, decade into this what what is your message to them what do you want to tell them you know reporting in its basic essence is you're supposed to be talking about the things that you see and hear and experience on on the ground so don't just don't just write what you think your editor wants or what you think maybe your your audience wants to hear like um, If you saw something or you experienced or you went to some rally or some event that you know contradicts the narrative that you think you're supposed to be saying like you should tell that because um, good writing is really honest at the expense of everything else so try not to worry I think there's there's a little too much political correctness in this country sometimes especially among um, the progressive crowd and I think it's like you Good writing is not politically correct. Um, so I think just be candid and, and don't worry about getting criticized for it because like if you're honest, um, like there's a lot of people who are gonna, who are gonna respond to that. So if you, if you make that leap, like it, it can pay off. Well, we are very grateful for your sincerity and your stories. Uh, I, we can sense the emotion like it's been uh, it's been amazing to listen to to you so thank you very much and hunter Stewart speaking truth to power seems to echo from every word you say and I think your role and your voice of courage is a role model for many and the more we see marching on your path that's undeterred journalism and truth seeking the better our world will be thank you very much for spending time with us today and thank you for sharing your incredible story Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you.